Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, nice to see some more people in the room than earlier, but also nice to see lots of very familiar faces, which I feel very comfortable with. So um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Hopefully you will enjoy it. And I'm also not very tech savvy either, considering um, the title of the presentation. So forgive me if it doesn't go as smoothly as one would hope. But so just to put it in a bit of context, London Myth Ray and Bloomberg, oh no, I'd introduce myself first, I beg your pardon. So I'm Helen Child. Um, as Kim says, I, um, I run London Myth Ray and Bloomberg Space um, and I work for Bloomberg Corporate Philanthropy. So Bloomberg is a, an international global uh, news, data and information provider. Uh, we developed a new office building right in the heart of the City of London in 2017, well, we opened in 2017. The project ran through from 2010 right through to 2017. Um, we have 4,000 employees um, at our European headquarters, and part of the development of that build was the London Mithraeum Bloomberg space. Uh, of those 4,000 employees, they, they're very excited about our, our beautifully, beautifully designed Foster and Partners um, building. We, run, we won the Reba Sterling um, Architectural Award in 2018. Um, it's the most sustainable office building ever designed. Uh, so our employees love talking more about all of those things, but the thing they most enjoy telling other people about is the fact that they have a Roman temple in their basement. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've have a, we have a long history of um, supporting art and cultural um, activities at Bloomberg, um, especially in the corporate philanthropy department. We, we support over 600 um, cultural institutions around the world um, via our philanthropy team. Um, and so art was also incredibly important to us through the design of, the, of, of our new building. So we work with artists right from the very start of the design process. Um, and we ask all of the artists to take into consideration the history of the site. Um, we work with artists such as Christina Iglesias, and they made these beautiful artworks throughout our building, which really created the, the, um, the body of the building. Um, but things like the Christina Glacier's Forgotten Streams um, is, is inspired by the ancient river wall book that used to run the site. Uh, Arturo Herrera's work at the top um, there was inspired by um, some of the artifacts that were in the cage downstairs. Um, so again, it was just something that um, has, has been inspired by the history and archaeology of the site. So just to give a little bit more context to the site, I'm just going to play, hopefully, this short video. Here we go. Oh, check it out. Does it have sound? Oh. Where's the sound? It's actually so if we stop for a second. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, I should check that. Yeah. Sure. That sounds right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Should we go outside? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. Do that. It should ideally try now. If not, we gotta try the other whatever it could possibly be. This location has been the center of London for a couple of thousand years. So I hold it up. Okay. This is where they built their temples on, which is in the building. The temple of Petros tried to explain the history of the religion. We're contributing back into the community where we're honored to be able to uh, have a business. It's fine. The remains of a Roman temple have been uncovered near the mansion house in the city of London. It is the only one ever found within the city. The Temple of Mithras was built in London by the Romans in about 240 AD. It was a temple to the god Mithras. And Mithras is said to have killed a primordial bull in a cave and the temple represents the cave by being partly sunken into the ground. The temple was discovered in 1954 and it generated a huge amount of public interest. We queued for two and a half hours, but it was really worth it. This man with a big thing I've never seen before. Luckily, you're all experts, so you know what it's meant to say. It was from its original location in 1962. In collaboration with the City of 
London, Bloomberg was obliged to relocate and restore the temple as close to its original location as possible. And as you would expect from Bloomberg, we're embracing both tradition, but also innovation and creativity. Our first task was to dismantle the 1960s reconstruction. Once we'd salvaged all of the Roman material, our aim was to reconstruct the temple back at its original Roman ground level, which is actually about seven metres below modern street level. And it's the first time that we've been able to see the archaeology in this part of the city for half a century. We both felt it very important to go the extra mile and ensure that the reconstruction was handled with the utmost integrity. We had to quarry some new Kentish ragstone, which was what was used in the original building. We had a new handmade bricks built, and we sampled Roman mortars so that we could create accurate lime mortars and renders. There's very few people who have connected together archaeology and innovation, and I think that's a big gift that Bloomberg is giving, both creating community here in London, connecting it with ancient Londinium, but also forwarding the way that people can actually experience and even think about archaeology. Visitors will have the opportunity to enter the Temple of Mithras for a timed, immersive experience and through light and haze get a sense of the actual physical reconstruction of the temple. There's also an audio experience which picks up some of the sounds you might have heard in Roman London, but also some of the more mysterious sounds of the ceremonies and rituals that would have gone on in the building. As people have this experience with the Mithraeum, they'll understand much deeper what that actual Mithraeum was like in the past and how <laughs> <laughs> A great deal of attention has been paid to try and ensure that the London with Rome Bloomberg space is... ...getting a sense of what life was like 1800 years ago. Seamless. <laughs> Uh, the temple that we were going to be um, going to be working with, but we, we also, as part of the development of the builders, we were when we were um, uh, opening the site up. So for sustainability reasons, we reuse uh, most of the, the basements that we used uh, or that were there from the previous um, building, the Leland General Building. But there was also a corner of the site which um, which we knew we were going to have to enter in a much deeper area of the site that had never been touched before. And so this was the corner of the site. Um, which was going to be um, the new entrance into the Waterloo and City Line. So a new entrance to the Bank Underground Station, so 12 metres deep. And um, there was this um, area which, was, which was, was, was a run along the seam of the River Walbrook, and which was, again, one of the... We worked with the um, Museum of London Archaeology. Sophie, who's on the video there, she was meant to be joining us today, but she couldn't make it. So I do have... Uh, Louise in the audience and lots of other people from MOLA here who either helped out in some part of the dig or as Sadie's here as well. Where's Sadie? There she is. Um, so uh, collaborated very closely with the Museum of Archaeology and worked on this amazing um, um, uh, dig as well. And some incredible um, statistics from that dig. So 3,500 metric tons of soil, um, 80,000 hours, 14,000 artifacts. Um, 65,000 pieces of Roman pottery and 400 fragments of the wooden writing tablets. So again, it was an, a whole other aspect of the history of the, of the site that we, we wanted to showcase. Before Bloomberg even came along, um, Legal, and General, Legal and General decided they were going to redevelop the site back in 2004. So way before we got involved, um, Legal and General sat down with the city um, and a range of other people, so John Shepherd. Um, Catherine Wolfert, I think, um, and a, a range of people um, worked together to put together, and Catherine Stubbs, sorry, as well, um, came together to work to put together um, a brief for whoever took on the site to ensure that whatever happened to the temple in particular um, was going to be, hopefully, um, a, a darn sight better than the, uh, than the legal and general um, situation. So the main things that they put in together was to salvage the Roman material and reuse in a new reconstruction, put it back where it was originally found and at the right um, ground level, provide accurate information for visitors, make it free and, again, most important, importantly, accessible to all. And then this is a little bit more tricky than to provide an um, to, um, evoc evocation of, of, of a Mithraeum as it may have been used 2,000 years ago. And considering 
there was so little written about it, considering um, that there was, you know, it was um, there, there wasn't a huge amount of information for us to go on to try and emote, to try and emote what it would have felt like to have been in the Mithraeum was what we had to really deal with. And so we didn't want to go too far. We didn't want we wanted to get the balance right. And who knew what really sort of went on in there? And so it was the combination of, of the artifacts that we were going to work with, but also um, when Bloomberg came along, then the, um, what we were going to do with the temple that then led to us being able to uh, put together a proposal which to create a new cultural hub for the city. I think Mike Bloomberg, when he first heard about the temple and about the, um, the excavations and everything else, he was so excited um, for us to be part of the city's history and for us to be to, to provide something which was going to be really truly accessible, free for the public, um, and something really unique and exciting um, for for the city of London um, <coughs> to work with. So it was that investment that he wanted to provide and to make it such a um, a remarkable site meant that we were able to work with the best um, <coughs> historians, archaeologists, designers, put together this amazing team of people to create something really truly special. So we put together um, a design brief for a design competition for us. Oh, wow. Um, can I get a few extra minutes for my technical issues? Um, so we put together a design brief, um, and it was um, the key things out of that design brief for our um, competition was it had to be memorable, powerful, engaging, scholarly, but accessible, um, and also have an emotional response for people. You know, simple, really. Again, this is just a list of the people that were on that amazing crack team of people to ensure we got this balance between technology, innovation, uniqueness, but also scholarly you know, um, attention to detail. We wanted it to be um, correct and accessible. We created this three-story three space, three-room space, putting the, um, as not directed, but as requested, um, putting the temple back to its original position as close as possible. It's facing in the right direction. It's at the right ground level. It's a few meters to the west, I think, that it was originally um, was originally built, but um, as close as we could get it. And then two extra rooms, which would allow us to provide information and create a visitor experience around the temple. Once we decided on the space, we had to decide what was going to go in it. We had a, a, a peer review in 2014, um, we knew the reconstruction was going to, to go in, that was a given, but then it was what we were going to add, um, add to go with that. We had to look at, when we, we, we did this peer review, again, it was a mixture of um, scholars, academics, um, visitors, curators, um, and we wanted to look at you know, what to include, what, sat, what, what, did, what were people going to see, what were people going to hear, what were people going to smell. Um, the discussion around music, for example, um, Again, we had lots of conversation around, you know, what content to use, what, what, you know, what, um, what instruments to use. I still can't get my head around um, and, all, and stop imagining Roger Tomlin in his kitchen <laughs> with his cheese grater. Um, no, it was the actual, actual bells for the case. I don't know. It um, and um, but again, that, that content. You know, there was going to be chanting. What was the chanting going to be? Um, you know, whether, were we going to use smells? Thank goodness for my hosts, bless them, who spend all day every day in there, that we didn't you go down the smell route of chicken or incense or something like that. So I'm glad that they, that they moved away from that. Um, the, were we going to use colour? So there's, again, there's, um, there is um, record of colours being used within Mithraeum so across lots of other of the um, Mithra, Mithras temples around, around the empire. But for, for ours, there wasn't enough of a, um, there wasn't enough evidence that, we, that there was a lot of colours used in ours. So we, again, we sort of pulled back from that. And then that atmosphere, how do we create the atmosphere? What do we use to create that atmosphere? Does it need to be spooky? Does it need to be, you know, we wanted it to be, to be atmospheric, but not creepy. We wanted it to be, um, you know, we wanted it to be um, dark and mysterious. But um, again, like not, not scary or intimidating for, for visitors. But we had to, to use the question, where do we use technology and where do we keep it simple? And it's harder, harder than it sounds when you're working with an organization like Local Projects, who, again, are an amazing digital um, or organization that does digital uh, and museum design. Um, and they were all, you know, they were all for the, all the bells and whistles. And we had to really, again, pair it back to come up with something um, which suited our brief as well. 
So what we came up with, I'm not going to show their video because I don't think I've got time, but what we came up with was, was um, again, the use of haze and light um, to create something incredibly atmospheric um, down in the space. We wanted to keep it very simple. Um, and the visitors who go down there, again, have this, this sense of awe when they go in there. They, they come out and they say they really felt felt what it would have been like there to be there, but without it being overpowering. And for us, again, that feedback between visitors, especially the real, you were, um, we were talking about who the visitors are to our spaces, and you have these visitors who come in and they're so, so into their Romans, and they're so, so into Mithras, and they're, you know, they're, and we have scholars, we have enthusiasts, we have all these different, um, different visitors, and to appeal to all of them across um, the different genres um, has been very successful. Again, the different levels we were trying to, to use the um, technology throughout the space. On the mezzanine level, you're, you're, you're learning about uh, Mithras and the cult, um, but we're using technology there just to create an atmosphere again. So we're using shadows. Um, there is technology in there to give you an extra depth of knowledge if you want it, but in general, it's there to also to create this atmosphere. The artifact wall that we have on the gallery level, again, is the combination of technology we heard about earlier in... Um, in Ruth's presentation, um, where we where we were able to have this amazing, beautiful, architecturally designed um, uh, display of the artifacts, we were only able to do that because we were in conjunction. We were going to use the, develop the digital content as well. So it meant we didn't have to have lots of content on the wall with the art, art um, artifacts, but it meant was a, there's an incredibly accessible, simple way. Um, if you're in the space, I heard that earlier. Um, then. Um, to, to, to use the tablets. And again, watching the visitors engage, when we had a recent visitor survey, it's like about 80% of the visitors who came in interacted, they used the, they used the tablet, and they reported back, oh, they reported back that, uh, that it was easy to use and it was accessible. Again, you have people sitting there for hours looking on it, um, all sorts of generations, and kids on the floor, again, all super engaged. I've got to stop. So the oral history project, you can go on online and look at it. It's a beautiful digital historical project that we did um, to celebrate the anniversary of the, um, of the temple being found. And that digital content is now, again, it's available and it's, and it's there for people to access in the future for a legacy. Our artwork, I'll skip over that. Since opening, 230,000 visitors, 830 volunteers and uh, lots of volunteer hours but again for us it's the success of the space we had no idea how many people were going to come in um, and uh, and again the feedback that we've had from the space has been so positive hosting events including family activity events mosaic making treasure hunts junior archaeology day again we're trying to have these different different gay different days and different ways for um, for the different generations to you know, to, um, to access the history and, um, and understand it in a different level. This year as well, we also had, we've had obviously um, artwork as well, so, and art. So we've had Caroline and her books coming in and helping bring the space alive. But also this year, we also had a poetry um, evening where jo um, Josephine Barmer came in. She'd written um, some beautiful poetry um, inspired by the writing tablets, the wooden writing tablets. And then the students from Notre Dame University came in and... Um, and presented it and performed it. And again, just seeing, using art like that to bring the different, um, the different pieces of the artifacts and everything alive was, was really, really special. Is that school's program? And so for us, what's next? So we are going to continue to develop our digital content, not to design different things within the museum, but to really work on the digital content that people can access as they go around the museum. So some of the feedback that we've had is that um, because they're moving through the experience, they're going through the space, um, there is information there, but it's not always easily accessible because it can get really, really busy. And also in the areas that they want to learn about the space, for example, the temple, there's nothing in there because we wanted that all to be about the experience. So by adding digital content um, on a new app that's going to be developed to go around the museum with you um, will mean that, again, it's the, it's the continuation of, um, of the information in the areas that they really want to see it so they can link it together. Um, so... That is what we're going to be focusing on in 20, um, 20, 2020, along with additional, again, supporting Mola and the team um, with the, you know, the, the um, continued, um, uh, the continued research, I guess, around the rest of the collection um, that's still to come. One last final plug, because I'm here and I've got a captive audience. So, uh, so for art lovers in the audience here. Uh, down in Bloomberg Arcade, which is the main arcade that runs through the river, uh, runs through the building, sorry, uh, which follows an old Roman route. 
um, back in the day, just to link it back, there you are. Um, so we have got a new art installation that is running from, um, from now right through to January the 10th. It's called Imminence by, uh, and it's produced by an art collective called Novak. Um, and um, produced by um, Artichokes, the company that's re responsible for uh, Lumiere London, etc. So this amazing uh, immersive um, light projection that moves constantly and it runs throughout the whole of the space. And so that'll be in there till um, January the 10th. So you're very welcome to come and look at that. <laughs>